Brendan Crabb is one of Australia's leading microbiologists and he is also the director and CEO of the world famous Burnett Institute. Brendan joins us now, not in the Sky Studios, but because we're in Victoria, he's holed up at home. Welcome, Brendan. Thanks for having me, Nick and Rita. Yes, from my bungalow. <laughs> now, Brendan, what does the latest science tell us about airborne transmission of COVID-19 and what does this mean for Australia's hotel quarantine arrangements? Well, I heard you say earlier that, uh, you know, this virus is super infectious and uh, only takes, uh, you know, 20 seconds or so to, to jump from A to B. It's actually not that infectious uh, as viruses go. What the difference is from what we originally thought to what happens now is that it's transmitted through the air, probably predominantly, but if not predominantly, at least it's a common mode of transmission. It's that different way of thinking rather than contacts, rather than these big respiratory droplets that require you to be very close to a person. That's, that's changing everything. You can mitigate transmission through the air and the area we really need to tighten up is hotel quarantine. Since November, there have been 17 escapes, uh, seven in Sydney, three in Melbourne and Brisbane, two each in Adelaide and Perth from hotel quarantine, several in New Zealand as well. All of them probably or definitely caused by um, not mitigating airborne transmission. And so that's something we, we just have to uh, address. Um, we're starting to talk about it a lot. We know that it's happening. We know that it's causing major disruptions, such as this current Victorian outbreak from, from Adelaide, as, as you described earlier, from a hotel quarantine leak where an uninfected person got infected in, in a hotel in Adelaide and then moved, came to Melbourne, and away we went. So unfortunately, airborne transmission turns out to be super important, and we do know how to deal with it. We just need to, to get on our skates and do it. And unfortunately, uh, in Australia, we don't have a, a federally driven universal attitude that acknowledges its importance and, and lays out some guidelines for how we deal with it. So what does that mean in practical terms, Brendan? Does that mean that uh, the current hotel quarantine arrangements are not fit for purpose? Does it mean we do need to move to purpose-built quarantine facilities like many are now arguing? Ultimately, we do. We're going to need quarantine for a long time, years probably, not for every traveller as time goes on, but we will still need quarantine and they'll need to be purpose-built to take care of airborne transmission. There's only so much you could do in a hotel. Um, but we do know that you can improve uh, conditions in a hotel. You can improve the airflow, you can in improve the personal protective equipment and the mm. procedures and practices. That's happening in a piecemeal, patchy way throughout the country. And uh, we're looking for uh, the federal government to acknowledge airborne transmission, but to do it much stronger and to give the states really clear, unambiguous guidelines, um, even standards as to what they should do. And I can't say there wouldn't be any hotel quarantine outbreaks, as, as Rita said earlier, stuff can still happen, but uh, there's every chance uh, they'd, be, they'd be markedly reduced. And every escape from all of those places has been really costly. Fortunately, we haven't had any serious outbreak. Let's hope that doesn't happen in Victoria. Obviously it's serious, but not serious like Victoria's whoops, second wave serious. Um, so it can be fixed, and Brendan, it needs can I to ask... be fixed. Gotcha. And Brendan, can I ask, does this latest sort of science around airborne transmission, uh, does that have any bearing on government recommendations around mask wearing, particularly in outdoor settings? Well, it explains why masks work well in indoor settings. Um, I don't know why the recommendation is there for outdoor settings. On the face of it, um, I, it doesn't make a lot of sense epidemiologically because not too much transmission we don't think is occurring outside. You'd have to ask those who made the decision that. But my guess is that it's just to make a universal policy. So people just wear the mask, whether they go in and out of a train, in and out of a tram, in and out of a shop, in and out of a household with lots of people in it. They've just got a mask on. I, I'm, I'm imagining that's the reason. Um, you certainly wouldn't want to do it outside of an emergency situation like we've currently got. It doesn't make a lot of practical sense. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm only speculating that that's the reason for the out out outside usage. Yeah. And just finally, what's your assessment of the vaccine rollout program in Australia 
to date, Brendan. I know you follow the government's response to pandemics all over the world. How do you think Australia is faring? And just on that, if I could also ask, how do you think we can motivate those mm. reluctant, uh, over 50s in particular, to get vaccinated? What, yeah. what, what can we do to, to get them uh, motivated and, and, and uh, getting yeah, vaccinated yeah. as soon as they can? No, that's the big. That's the big point. Look, from from a government point of view, our vaccine procurement process was really, from my point of view, was excellent. I've said that for the best part of the year, and and ensuring some sovereign capacity turned out to be a masterstroke. Um, and we ended up with this with this really excellent vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, that is proving to itself to be better and better all the time. Made here in Australia, so we've got guaranteed doses. It's hard to get internationally. So procurement. From my perspective, it was good. You can always, with the benefit of hindsight, say we should have done a bit of this or done a bit of that. But we've, we've ended up with 150 million plus doses of top quality vaccine either here or coming for, for a population of 25 million. So that side's good. Um, rollout's been slow, and there's lots of uh, reasons for that. Um, I'm not overly concerned about uh, authorities at a state and federal level. I think they're sorting it out. I'm more concerned about the issue you just raised, Rita, about hesitancy. You know, we're going to need 80% or so of Australians vaccinated to have any chance of this magical herd immunity. And, and kids are not getting vaccinated, of course, at the moment. That might happen later on, but they can't be vaccinated yet. And we've got 20 or more percent of the population who say uh, they don't want to get vaccinated, they want to wait and see and that sort of thing. If if they stay that way, then we're, then we're in real trouble. So you're quite right. Um, look, I think there's a couple of things that have happened. For, for older 50s, um, there'll have to be very targeted, aggressive campaigns uh, that, that match the different, uh, the different subgroups. But, you know, you've got to recognise if you're over 50 and you get COVID, you've got a 1% chance of dying. If you're over 70, you've got a 10% chance mm. of dying of COVID. And we've now seen with the current incursion um, that there's every chance you're going to face COVID. The variants of COVID that are around now are much worse than those that were around in, in Victoria's second wave, and those that will be around in three or four months' time will be worse than those that are around now. So, you know, the reason we have so many people that are over 50 is because of how good vaccines are. You know, we don't have measles, mumps, <laughs> rubella, diphtheria, tetanus, polio, smallpox, all of these things kept them alive in the first place. That's why they're here. The number one cause of increase in life expectancy is vaccination. There's no different with a COVID vaccine. It is magical. Um, and, and so don't believe any anything you see. Get out and get these incredibly good, safe vaccines. For those under 50, um, do your bit. Uh, there's, there is lower risk that you're going to get sick from COVID, but not no risk. Do your bit uh, for your friends, for your relatives, for your parents, for your grandparents. Get out there and get vaccinated. It's extremely safe. The goalposts have changed since the original recommendations around AstraZeneca were made. Blood clot issues extremely rare. It's being managed pretty well. The threat of virus is very real. Um, look, I'm trying to create a bit of anxiety for and people to get out and get it because <laughs> yeah. I feel anxious. Well, you, you, you explained it, Professor... You, you've explained it better than I think most of our public health bureaucrats have because that was ex that's exactly why people, whether they're over 50 or under 50, should get out there and, and, and get vaccinated. Professor Brendan Crabb, thank you so much for your time today. Um, my absolute pleasure. Thank you.